I love shrimp. These are me and my wife's pet shrimp. Look at how cute they are. Gribbity grabbing and nibbity munching all day long. That, that's all they do. But they got so teeny tiny beady eyes. Oh, I do have a soft spot for these shrimp too. Jumbo pan fried and butter sauce. Mm. And the coconut battered ones. Oh, to die for. Shrimp are found basically everywhere there is water. And just about every culinary culture in the world has multiple shrimp dishes. So it's kind of surprising it took until generation six to get an actual shrimp Pokemon. There were other crustaceans, sure, but never straight up a shrimp. But I suppose Kalos, the Pokemon region based on France, was a good place to introduce one. And not just because French cuisine is world renowned. In this video, we're going to talk about Clauncher and Clowitzer, what they are, and what they can teach us about the Lobster War. And there's another war happening too. The conflict happening in today's sponsor, the niche game known as Raid Shadow Legends. 7.5 billion humans could be playing Raid right now, so why wait? Join the fray on PC or mobile devices. Raid has something for everyone. It has a fully fledged world with deep characters for the lore lovers. It keeps the action going with non-stop battles and huge boss fights and high stakes PvP arenas for those into the competitiveness and the strategies you come up with. Team compositions can change everything, so those interested in perfecting and min-maxing their team balance will love it too. And there's a huge social aspect with clan versus clan battles, and loads of unique tournaments and events. New players get to use my link or scan the QR code right here and get a free starter pack with this cool in-game loot. And all players can simply open raid for 7 days before February 20th and get Ronda Rousey. Yeah, the MMA megastar is a champion in-game now. Strange, but cool. Punching beasts with a fire punch. And you can use the promo code RAIDRONDA to get a bunch of useful items too. And right now, there's a CHAMPIONS ELECT EVENT! All new players will get to vote on your favorite starter champion with the links below, and all voters have an opportunity to win in-game and real-life prizes, from epic and legendary items and champions, to Amazon gift cards worth up to a thousand dollars! But this ends February 10th, so head to those links below now! But first, we gotta talk about the Pokémon themselves. One look at Clauncher, and yep, it's, it's, it's a shrimp with some lobster elements in there. It's got one big claw, just like Kingler, because crustaceans sometimes lose arms, but they grow them back. But this of course means that one claw will be bigger than the other while the other one is still regrowing. However, there are some species of crab that do always have one gargantuan claw. Well, the males anyway. Male fiddler crabs have a huge claw to be intimidating. However, there is also a shrimp. A shrimpy shrimp that shrimps shrimpily. Pistol shrimp have one claw much larger than the other. And for an actually cool reason, they can actually use that huge claw to shoot a bubble so gosh darn hard that it functionally acts as a weapon that they can use both for self-defense and for hunting prey, just like a gun. And they named it after the pistol class of guns specifically, not just because it's small, but because its claw functions much like an old school pistol. A joint allows the hammer part to move backwards into a right-angled position. When released, it snaps into the other part of the claw, which creates a cavitation bubble strong enough to kill small prey and shatter small glass jars. Doing this also generates acoustic pressures of up to 12 psi at a distance of 4 centimeters from the claw, which might not sound like much, but remember, it's a shrimp. And here's where they go nuts. As it ejects from the claw, the bubble reaches speeds of around 100 kilometers an hour. And meanwhile, Clowitzer's Dex says, by expelling water from the nozzle in the back of its claw, it can move at a speed of 60 knots. Now, I'm not a seaman, was once, not anymore, but I don't know what tying knots has to do with speed, but doing the conversions, it works out to being a little over 69 miles per hour. The pistol shrimp wait in their little burrows with their antenna sticking out of the hole, and when they feel a fish swim by, they stick their big, meaty claw out of the hole and shoot at their prey. For anything the same size as it is or bigger, it mostly just knocks the prey unconscious. But that's enough for the shrimp to be able to kill it after that. Plauncher takes this pistol shooting to a whole nother level though. Not only can it use water to knock down flying prey, but also, through controlled expulsions of internal gas, it can expel water like a pistol shot at close 
distances, it can shatter rock. Okay, wow. And then Clowitzer's claws can launch cannonballs of water powerful enough to pierce tanker holes. Almost like how a howitzer fires cannonballs into tanker holes. I wonder if that has anything to do with its name. Now, pistol shrimp aren't called that just because of how fast the bubble travels, but also because the snap is so incredibly terrifyingly loud. So loud that it's actually one of the loudest animal noises in the entire ocean. The top three loudest things in the ocean. Screamy white whale. They see behemoth whale. And the two inch shrimp. Pichu. Except it's more like. The snap reaches a peak pressure level of 218 decibels, which is almost 100 decibels louder than a thunderclap. And anything above 85 is considered bad for your ears, so having a clauncher would definitely be bad for your hearing. And a cacophony of a group of pistol shrimps snapping is so loud that it frequently interferes with sonar and other underwater communication technologies. And their snap is so fast and so loud that it actually causes sonoluminescence, which is when light gets emitted from an imploding bubble in liquid. Basically, the bubble forms and pops so fast that a small burst of light in a broad spectrum happens. Physics just goes haywire. Something should not be able to accelerate and move that quickly through water. But the pistol shrimp name is even better now, right? It's just like the flash coming out of a barrel of a gun. Or the barrel of a cannon, I guess. Which is where Clowitzer comes in. It's no longer just a launcher, it's a howitzer. An old-fashioned artillery gun somewhere between a cannon and a mortar. Nobody knows exactly who invented the howitzer because it just sort of evolved into being over time. Like, do the 1420s Hoffness cannons count as a howitzer? What about all the other middling cannons and mortars between then and the 1800s, like the Ottoman's Abbas gun? There's no straight answers here, but what does have a straight answer is this. What is the most well-known and broadly used howitzer? Why, it's the Napoleon 12-pounder, of course. The howitzer first used by the French army and then also heavily used in the first American Civil War. And in World War I, howitzers became the cannon of choice due to the prevalence of trench warfare. In fact, just before the war, the French invented the auto frittage technique, which allowed their howitzers to become significantly more powerful while also being smaller and lighter. So just like a pistol shrimp, it's an unbelievable amount of power packed into such a tiny little cannon. But speaking of trench warfare, the pistol shrimp isn't the only thing Clauncher and Clowitzer are based on. They are both extremely blue. And another extremely blue, well-known crustacean with big claws? Why, that's the Procambarus alani, otherwise known as the Everglades crayfish, the Florida crayfish, blue crayfish, or they're known as crawdads in some areas, such as where I grew up. You know, it's that debate as old as time itself. Is it a crawdad? A crayfish? A crawl to daddy? Crawl Daddy? Freshwater Lobster? Rock Lobster? Or Yabbies? Who calls them a Yabby? This is not a Yabby! Looks more like a Laurel to me! <clears throat> anyway, in the wild, they're all found under rocks in muddy creeks. Sort of akin to the trenches, maybe? And they can be anywhere from brown tan to a subtle blue. But in the aquarium pet business, they've bred captive ones to be a bright blue, anywhere from sapphire to more of a cobalt. And most people outside of Florida are probably way more familiar with the captive variety, including Pokemon's designers. Or maybe it's just blue because it's water type. But another famous, but extremely rare, blue crustacean that could have inspired them too is the American Lobster, which has an estimated 1 in 2 million chance of being blue. It's just like a real-life shiny Pokemon. Just look at Claudia at the Akron Zoo. She's so pretty. But actually, there is a color that's even rarer for lobsters to be than blue. Red. What? Now, normally lobsters turn red when you cook them, but they are normally a mottled brownish, greenish, reddish, sometimes bluish color. But there is a 1 in 10 million chance that they will be red naturally, which is likely why these Pokemon use red as their shiny color. Or maybe it's just a reference to lobsters once you cook them. Both Pokémon in this line have dex entries in Usum that mention its big claw being eaten as meat when it falls off, because there's nothing more tasty than BIG MEATY CLAWS! And obviously, the real-world inspiration of this Pokédex entry is pretty self-explanatory. Yum yum yum. But did you know that this yum 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 deliciousness also started a war? In the 1960s, no less. This ain't some far-off thing. There are Lobster War veterans alive today. And that is what they called the war, too. 
the Lobster War. Here's the story. Lobsters are American. They live around the waters of the Americas, and they were once so abundant that the richer colonizers in the 1700s didn't really want them. They are bugs, rats of the ocean. Let the locals, prisoners, and peasants eat them. And so they did, in large quantities. And by the 1880s, they became rarer because they were being eaten so much. And with scarcity comes value. And plus, they're pretty pretty on a plate. And God, I want a lobster roll now. You think you can change the divine plan with your prayers? I smite thee with cancer. <coughs> <coughs> Oh. Oh, ha ha, I get it. Anyway, lobster is fancy food now, and for a while, many of the colonizing countries had been importing them for their nobility to eat, or even sending their own fishing ships to go stock up on them and then make the long journey back. Such a journey is worth it because they're so valuable in Europe, France especially, as they are quite into the culinary arts at this point in time. And now fast forward to 1961, and the French lobster fishing ships get too close to Brazil for their liking. According to international law, a nation's territorial waters extends 200 nautical miles from their coastline, so any resource in that area belongs to that country. And these French fishing ships, oh, they were coming in close, 87 nautical miles in. Brazil asked nicely for them to leave at first, but the poor French, their ego was still shattered from World War II, and they needed to take a stand and make a name for itself, and they said, non. So the Brazilian government sent a few small warships out to try and intimidate them, but it didn't work. Hon hon hon, these Portuguese are rejects can do nothing nothing to stop moi from attaining my succulent crustacean flesh. So, of course, the Brazilians considered this not an act of war, but an act of hostility, and would not stand for it. That's kind of what they did, though. For over a year, French fishing ships would still continue to come, Brazilian warships would go out to intimidate them, cannons out and all, and the French would just keep fishing and then leave, boats filled with Brazilian lobster. Until, eventually, the French sent their own warship to defend the fishing ships. And there was a conflict. Not a deadly one! thankfully, but it did result in the Brazilian army taking over a French ship, and the French government was not happy about that, and they, along with the Brazilians, legitimately considered going to war over lobsters. They wound up short of actually declaring war, however. They would wind up in adjudication instead, essentially international court. You see, at the time, that coastline country owns the waters thing technically only covers things on and under the sea floor, or the continental shelf. Lobsters walk along the floor, they are ours, said Brazil. Oh, but lobsters also swim and are thus fish, thus we can harvest them, said France. Does a kangaroo become a bird when it hops? shouted Brazil. And I should stress, these are the actual, real arguments they were making. Lives were actually at stake, war was actually being considered, is a kangaroo a bird? Someone please answer them. It's good to always remember just how fragile we all are. Well, in the end, they compromised. France had to get Brazilian licenses to fish, though they still had to stick with the nearby high seas to do their fishing rather than being so close to the shoreline. The important thing here, though, is that France really, really likes their lobster. Almost enough to go to war over it. So, a French Pokémon region featuring a lobster that is also a French weapon of war? Perfection.